today we're going to talk about metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance, the inflammation key to detox. So, so metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance. I'm sure you've heard about it. The question is, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about a longer, healthier life. And to do that, you absolutely must learn how to protect yourself and your family from degenerative diseases that harm and kill most Americans. So the real question comes, why do we get sick? That's the question that has to be answered before you can do anything effective about it. Now, few of us understand that as, as we become older, we become chronically ill. And what we don't know then, if we don't understand how that happens, is what we really can do to stay healthier. And the answer is we'll surprise you and allow you to change your health and your future in wonderful ways. Many people realize that obesity and diabetes have become much more common in the United States. All you have to do is walk through the airports, walk through the shopping centers, go grocery shopping. You notice that we look much sicker than we used to. We certainly look much more pregnant than we used to. Actually, these are now epidemic in America, and more individuals are suffering every year. So let's consider the growing prevalence of diabetes in the United States. Taking 1990, the darker blue color, shown in just four states here, indicates a significant prevalence of diabetes. Diabetic trends in 1990, just not 20 years ago. 1991, 92, 93, 94. 95, 96, you'll notice that more darker coloration is occurring as we go through the years, 97, 98, and then we hit 1999, when now roughly eight to 10% of the population in three states is showing diabetic patterns. Then we go to 2000, 2001, we see another jump in the number of people with diabetes. You'll notice we had to go to the other color as we indicate more than 10% of the population indeed is suffering. Whoops. We went from 2001 to the number of adults diagnosed with diabetes in 97 showing a substantial number, 2007, 97, 2007. You see the darker colorations become much more impressive. I want you to pay attention. This is an age-adjusted percentage of U.S. adults with diagnosed diabetes in 1997, that first map that I showed you. Look at this blank area here as we're talking about 6 to 7, 7.5 to 8, and above 9%. Watch what happens 10 years later. A shift in the states into this area here that was previously empty. Here's an example of obesity and diabetes. 1994, obesity, diabetes, very similar pattern. 2000, very similar pattern. 2007, remarkably same pattern. Obesity, diabetes. You'll notice not only is the pattern the same, but the worsening colors as you're going across. Now consider this, the American epidemic of obesity. The obesity trends among adults, 1985 in the United States. Again, the darker coloration means more serious issues. Obesity, 1986, 87, 88, 89, 90, and we had to introduce in 1991 a darker color because now 10 to 14 percent of the population is considered obese, which is about 30 pounds overweight for a five foot four person. 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97. We had to introduce a new color because now more than 15% of the population is clearly obese by 1997. 98, 99, look at that vast increase. And again, we're talking about the American heartland and Southeast primarily showing problems. Whoops, not just there, how about we spread to the coasts now, both coasts. 2001, we introduce again another color where almost a quarter of the population is showing obesity. 2002, 2003, 2004, anyone see a disturbing trend on the obesity pattern? 2005, we have introduced another color where more than 25% 
of the population is showing obesity by standard measurements, 2006, 2007. You can imagine that when you've got one state showing up with low numbers, which would be between 10 and 15 percent of the population, and the rest of the states far exceeding that in some cases, we have a serious public health problem that has occurred in the last 20 years. Now, here's the state obesity rates in 2008. I put 25 on here because that is almost the general population, almost the rule. Many of the states exceed that 25. And you start looking at that and going, that's a serious public health problem. It's so serious that the National Health and Nutrition Evaluation Study that's conducted every four or every 10 years for a four year period, 1976 through 1980, then 1999 through 2000. These are the measurement trends virtually doubling on the obesity and again about 50% oh, worse on the overweight, which is approaching obesity. Both trends you'll notice are absolutely up. Here's childhood obesity trends by state, lest we think that this is just the adults. And again, you'll notice the American heartland is suffering quite significantly in terms of 14, 15 percent, 11, 12, 10. Those are significant numbers for our children because the school portraits now look like this instead of skinny when we grew up. Of course, part of the problem is what should be banned in schools and which generally is, oh, I'm sorry, this picture was taken at home. Because what we do is we screw up the nutrition for our children on a routine basis, not just at schools. You know, the studies have been done by Abram Hoffer and others 20 plus years ago showing that if you just change the way that kids eat at school, their behavior markedly changes, their attention in school, their grades, all of these things change. Same thing has been done in, in child uh, detention centers and showing the recidivism or return to those as juvenile delinquents dramatically changes by taking the sugar and starchy foods and the preserved and processed foods out of the diet available to them. So poor eating habits and lack of exercise certainly help to explain weight gain. But what's the real cause of our poor health? We can say maybe they're related, but not necessarily. So the question really comes down to why we are the fattest and the sickest generation in American history. Well now, there's a number of modern factors that contribute to these major changes in our health and understanding those factors will allow you to make choices to make a difference for yourself and for those you love. And that's the introduction to understanding metabolic syndrome. Now it's very easy to say, well metabolic syndrome is simply, you know, being overweight or having too high a blood sugar and so on. That's an oversimplification of the process. It's a term for health problems that are often observed in people who have or who are developing heart and artery diseases. But of course that's the next guy, that's not you. Heart attacks seem to attack surprisingly to people who never expected to get one, except that we can identify predisposing factors anymore because almost half of Americans will die from heart attacks and strokes. And diabetes certainly contributes to a number of these deaths and you've seen the growing trends in diabetes, a great deal of concern for the kinds of problems that we're looking at in terms of what are deadly and disabling diseases, the ones that are costing us all the Medicare dollars, the ones that are costing us all of the comfort in our lives, especially as we get older. It means that getting older for the golden years looks more like rusting rather than enjoying. Here's an example, heart disease death rates in the year 1996 to 2000. And again, you can see that the heartland has a significant concentration. The heartland, the southeast, the northeast, these areas are suffering dramatically. We're starting in on the west coast over here. That's 10 years ago. Whites aged 35 years and older by county. You'll notice again the little scoring down here is the darker it gets, the worse it gets we have become increasingly sick. The obesity trends again in the year 2000 that would fit for this, this example right here for heart disease rates, here's the obesity trends. 
we're starting to get fatter in areas that still haven't shown the increase in heart disease rate. Here's the heartland with a major concentration. How about heart disease death rates in the year 2000 to 2004, which is starting to get real close to the present time. And you'll notice that all we're doing is becoming more and more dense and spreading out more and more to other areas of the, uh, of the neighboring uh, counties. Obesity trends in 2004, you'll notice fit this map quite well with heart disease rates and obesity trends. Almost a third of Americans die from heart attacks or strokes on a reasonable basis every year, but basically if you add together all of the comorbid conditions, you're looking at about half of the people dying from that. Diabetes again contributing to those deaths. Here's the diagnosed diabetes rates, 1997. You'll notice the dark center again in the heartland, the southeast, the eastern seaboard, again on the western seaboard. You know, I think one of the problems with these areas in the middle is the mountains. Kind of hard to concentrate in the mountains, and if you do, you probably do more of your own cooking than you used to in the, uh, than you're used to in the cities. Here's diagnosed diabetes 2007. You notice the marked increase in concentration. Here's diabetes diagnosed 1997, 2007. 97, 2007. We are talking about a major public health catastrophe happening within a 10 year period. 97, 2007. And in the face of this, we're looking at, quote, health care reform. Health care reform to take care of all these sick people. It seems to me that the doctor crisis, the medicine crisis, the drug crisis, whatever you want to call it, from 97 to 2007 is not what's responsible for this increase in the diagnoses of diabetes and then the problems associated with obesity and heart disease. Here again are heart disease death rates 2000 to 2004 and stroke death rates. That's on this bottom portion of the slide. You'll notice that the heart disease concentration and the stroke concentration very similarly overlie. Now, we're talking just five years ago. What happens when you add in those that are diagnosed, diagnosed with diabetes? The map from 2007, you'll notice almost a direct overlie. When you add in the obesity trends from 2004, the latest one we have the data on, you'll notice that the maps are clearly coincident. So what we have is an association that you can easily see with obesity and diabetes dramatically increasing across the heartland and the eastern seaboard, the southeast. We are looking at how we get old and die. So the question is, how can you avoid these health problems? Well, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of weight any old day. And indeed, that becomes more and more significant as many people who have deadly cardiovascular diseases exhibit similar risk factors. If you have three or more of the following, you might have metabolic syndrome. So take the fingers of one hand. We have to limit this to one hand because in Texas, Aggies would have to go to the second hand and that gets more confusing. But if your stomach is a bit too large, which would be over 40 inches for a man, over 35 inches for a woman. For a woman, that is somewhat smaller than size 18. I'll just share that with you right now. And you can measure it quite easily at home, privacy of your own home. How about if you're being treated for high blood pressure? You would know that. Or if your blood pressure exceeds either 120 systolic or 80 diastolic. Of course, we've always heard that 120 over 80 is ideal. The deal is once you start gradually climbing with those numbers, you are increasing your risk factors. Again, something easy to do. You can buy the machine, watch yourself at home. What if your blood sugar level is over 100 before eating breakfast? You know, they do all these health screenings in the mall and they get your blood sugar and they get your cholesterol and all this, your triglycerides. Those are useless and worthless. Useless and worthless. Because the values you need to know are the ones before you eat in the morning and then having had a defined meal, in other words, enough content to raise sugars, you want to know what it was two hours later. Those numbers are the ones that matter. But 
your blood sugar before eating. So if you're going to do something, do it at your doctor's office or at the hospital clinic, whatever, before eating breakfast. Those are the ones that matter. Here's a simple blood sugar monitor. You can get those, do those in the comfort of your own home. All of these things that we're telling you here so far have really amounted to home health management. You can monitor yourself. Now we get to the point where your blood triglycerides measure over 100 before eating breakfast. 150, I'm sorry, before eating breakfast. Here's a doctor measurement. You've got to have a laboratory to do this test. Here's what triglycerides look like. They don't look all that evil. However, they're really not that evil. The problem is, is that when your measurement is over 150, you've got a significant risk factor developing, and that's what we're talking about with metabolic syndrome. Another doctor measurement, your HDL, or heart protective cholesterol, is below 40 for a man, below 50 for a woman, before eating breakfast. So with these simple measurements right here, you can start pinning down something called metabolic syndrome. That's what HDL cholesterol looks like, a bit more complicated, and that you want a lot of, because the more you have, the more protected you are. So what does it really mean to have metabolic syndrome? Well, simply stated, the cards are stacked against you. The risk factors that indicate metabolic syndrome are signs that you are at risk for developing cardiovascular diseases and other debilitating conditions. These are risk factors showing metabolic syndrome and they can be tied to the diseases that you want to avoid in your life. There's about one chance out of two that you'll die from a heart attack or stroke despite the best efforts of modern medical care. You have to remember that heart attack strikes out of the blue. Forty percent of the people who get their first heart attack do not have what they consider to be known risk factors. The doctor hasn't told them you've got a heart condition, they haven't had chest pains of concern, they are walking around playing golf, doing gardening, leading their lives, and they have a heart attack. Stroke is something definitely not to mess with. Stroke is real. It's walkers and canes and wheelchairs, and every one of us is just moments away from an unsuspected catastrophe a tragedy in our lives, not just for us, but for the family around us. Stroke is something that, in this viewpoint, is intensely preventable. Now, you might have already been diagnosed with blockage of your arteries in your neck, the carotids in your legs. That would be peripheral artery disease, and we certainly hear all of the advertisements now for PAD. You've got maybe peripheral artery disease, you have a higher risk of heart attack. That's true, but those are advertisements for drug treatments for it. Perhaps in your belly, you're being watched for an aortic aneurysm. They do the health screenings now where they do an ultrasound quickly across your belly looking at the width of your aorta. That's not an absolute guarantee in any way, shape, or form, but the moment you pass four centimeters, you now are increasingly at risk for exploding the artery in your belly. So if you've known that you've got any of these things or heart disease shown by angina chest pains or shortness of breath, you are of more concern for metabolic syndrome. Here's what the aortic aneurysm looks like. Very serious thing. My father had that at age 57. He was going into the operating room complaining that it was suddenly hurting worse than it had. He was actively dissecting his aorta at the time, and had he not already been scheduled for surgery in the operating room and known to have it, he would have died before they figured out what was wrong. He took a three-hour surgery, made a seven-and-a-half-hour surgery out of it, and has done very well. In fact, so well that two years ago at age 89, he broke down the repair, which is where they put a graft from here down to the arteries going to the legs, the femoral arteries. He broke that down and was actually taken to the operating room because a surgeon paid attention to what was going on, ordered the right studies, and got him evaluated and treated. Stanford Hospital in Palo Alto, California, refused to look at him. They said, well, folks like that just die. Well, you know why we have surgery? We have surgery for fo the folks you don't want to die. And so they flew him up to San Francisco, spent 10 hours, one night, 36 units of blood during the operation. And 10 days later, he went to the skilled nursing and 10 weeks later, went home to live alone. He then planted fruit trees 
which are now bearing fruit, I might add, and at age 92 just got his puppy. Here's what peripheral artery disease leads to. That's a picture of gangrene. Yes, that happens. Yes, that can be you, your relative. That steals comfort and function faster than you might ever believe. These are worrisome things. Aortic aneurysms pop off pieces from the inside, go south, and you can have gangrene by the blockage mechanism that way. You don't have to narrow your arteries. So if you've got any of these diagnoses that we've talked about, the associated health problems, could markedly worsen your condition with metabolic syndrome. So what's really bad about metabolic syndrome? Well, the real problem indicated by metabolic syndrome is an imbalance in blood sugar. Now, food choices and food amounts obviously contribute to being overweight or obese. Overweight being about 25 pounds heavier if you're a five foot four person. Obesity being 30 pounds or more heavier or even to diabetes, which is where you lose control of your blood sugar. But the story is much, much more complicated. And there's a number of different factors that come into play in creating and worsening this imbalance. The common and simplistic view is that we look at balancing the calories in, the calories out. You're always told, go get more activity, cut down the amount of foods that you're eating. But what happens is your doctors have very little understanding to counsel you about what really is important in what you are eating. Example, the doctors encourage you to do all those low fat foods. The doctors encourage you to eat margarine. The doctors encourage you to eat canola oil. Who has seen a canola plant? Nobody's seen a canola plant. That's because that's the Canadian Oil Association, canola, because they thought it would sell better than rapeseed, which is what it is. Rapeseed is a very poorly human nutritious food. You know, real oils are real foods. So the simplistic view normally doesn't work. So let's explain sugars and starches. When you eat carbohydrates, they're absorbed from your foods and that raises the level of sugar in your blood. Now think of blood sugar as the fuel that's needed by all the cells of your body. Your cells take in this needed sugar when your pancreas sends them the instruction. Of course, that instruction is insulin. A variety of circumstances, especially excessive sugar and starch intake, leads your pancreas to release higher and higher levels of insulin into the bloodstream. Well, of course, to balance the higher levels of sugars and starches coming in. So rather than driving more sugar into your cells and dropping your blood sugar too low, you're usually able to maintain a fairly normal level of circulating sugar so that your blood test actually looks okay even though you have undiagnosed higher insulin levels. How many people know that insulin is not one of the common measurements when you go to the doctor and say, give me my routine blood tests? They're not looking at that. Didn't we just talk about how in the last 20 years, but certainly in the last 10, obesity and diabetes are becoming increasingly epidemic, and yet we don't check for levels of insulin because if you ask your doctor about this, actually don't ask your doctor about this because it's embarrassing because he'll have an answer that is based upon no facts at all, because we don't train on this. This is not the kind of information that standard medicine is learning to uh, deal, deal with and understand. Oh, oh yes, well, I mean, we'll treat your diabetes or we'll treat your blood sugars, we'll give you metformin, will, whatever, but it's always responsive, not proactive. And reactive medicine means you're the one suffering while we're figuring out what to do about it. So if you have higher insulin levels, that's serious, because over time, your pancreas reaches the limit and it just can't put out any higher level of insulin. Then your blood sugar levels start to rise to higher than normal levels, and that's when your doctor starts to pay attention. Maybe. He's very busy. He's actually taking care of people who are really sick, and you're not really sick yet, so you might not actually come to attention. You will later. That's when you'll be really sick. You know, patients are always so understanding. Well, I really didn't have a chance to talk with my doctor about this because he was so busy taking care of patients. And I'm wondering, what the hell was he doing to you? I mean, you know, how can you be so busy taking care of patients that you don't have time to take care of patients? But apparently that's an accepted norm and just wait till healthcare reform kicks in. So your blood sugar starts to rise to higher than normal levels. And think of this higher and higher insulin is called insulin 
resistance. Now, I'm going to simplify it, but what on earth is insulin resistance? Now, this is the term used as a shorthand for more than normal insulin needed to instruct the cells to take in glucose, the blood sugar. This is a shorthand description. We'll make it make sense because it's an operational definition for you. Now, this really came about because of Gerald Reven, Stanford University endocrinologist. I met him 41 years ago while he was just starting to do this work. He was analyzing the changes associated with insulin resistance, only he didn't know it at the time. He was actually looking at hypoglycemia, low blood sugar patterns. He observed that when blood sugar levels are rising and insulin levels are high, a disturbing number of changes happen inside your body. So he was looking at hypoglycemia, which is low blood sugar. Now, obviously, normoglycemia is normal blood sugar. Hyperglycemia is high blood sugar, which we call glucose intolerance or diabetes. But when he looked at insulin levels in normoglycemic individuals, normal blood sugars, they were all over the map. You're supposed to ask, why was he looking at insulin levels? Well, it turns out when you want to study hypoglycemia, you should know what insulin levels are in normal people, and there weren't any good studies in the medical literature, so he went to establish this by taking medical students, medical professors and residents who had no history of diabetes, didn't have history in their family, so they had normal blood sugars, big deal. Let's measure their insulins. They are all over the map. That's a disturbing observation, because now how do you establish a normal insulin level for normal blood sugar because they don't appear to be related. So with hypoglycemia or low blood sugar, it would make sense to find too much insulin, uh, a mismatch of the insulin to the sugar. So you force sugar into the cells and the sugar in the blood is too low. Well, with hyperglycemia or high blood sugar, you would expect to find too little insulin, a condition, glucose intolerance, diabetes, that allows the sugar to stay in the blood because there's not enough insulin and eventually becomes too high. Well, normal glycemia would make sense for, to find just the right amount of insulin. You have just the right amount of blood sugar. These patterns are what you would like to see. Well, with hyperglycemia, high blood sugar, it makes sense to find too little insulin and create the expected changes found in diabetes, leading to high triglycerides, like cholesterol, sticky platelets, injured blood vessels, and so on. Well, when you have normal glycemia, normal blood sugar, it makes sense to find the just right amount of insulin, but when the sugars are normal and the insulin levels are high, the sugars are normal, the insulin levels are high, why is the question and what is causing the changes usually found in diabetes? Remember, diabetes is a condition of high blood sugar. We're talking now about normal blood sugar and those patients developing diabetic appearing disease changes, the high triglycerides, sticky platelets, injured blood vessels, and so on. Well, we even did a lot of scratching on his head because what he was discovering is that when an individual develops insulin resistance, the blood fats go up, the blood vessel linings get injured, and blockage or plaque appears. This is a different explanation than on the Plavix commercial, for which I apologize. They should never show a commercial like that because it's fraudulent and misleading. But they do, and no one asked me. Platelets become sticky and start to form plugs. You'll notice that all you have to do is take Plavix and you'll be alive forever. I don't think so. But all of these things, the blood fats, the blockage, and the plugs, all cause severe health problems like heart attacks, strokes, gangrene, blindness, kidney failure. As the insulin resistance progresses, higher blood pressures develop, heart function decreases, you get the increasing abdominal girth, your belly fat, elevating triglycerides, decreasing HDL cholesterol, even though it was normal before, and gradually elevating blood sugars. Remember, we started this normal glycemic, normal blood sugars. Now you're getting the elevated blood sugars, which more slowly return to normal after eating, which would suggest there's some problem with the insulin signaling system. 
Dr. Reeven struggled to put these findings together and originally in 1988 at the Banting Lecture called them Syndrome X. I say the Banting Lecture because that was named in honor of Banting who discovered insulin and described how diabetes looks and so on around 1924. So in 1988 he calls them Syndrome X because he doesn't know exactly, he knows he's got a tiger by the tail but he's not sure about the dimensions on this tiger. So X seemed a reasonable syndrome. Since then, the terms metabolic syndrome or cardiometabolic syndrome have been more widely used than his syndrome X. Incidentally, he's got a wonderful book called Syndrome X. But syndrome X or metabolic syndrome or cardiometabolic syndrome is not insulin resistance. It's a cluster subset that results from the condition of insulin resistance. So if we take a look at metabolic syndrome, it's only part of the insulin resistance story. So while heart and blood vessel diseases are the killers, metabolic syndrome leads to a whole host of various disease problems that have their origin with insulin resistance. So the reason we're after metabolic syndrome is because it's easy to track. We've got these five basic things we're looking for. If you've got three out of the five, Guess what? You've got a metabolic syndrome pattern. In other words, your risk factors are higher. What we're after is looking for risk factors we can easily identify that tell us you're on the way to developing these other diseases. So metabolic syndrome is associated with all of the following conditions. Overweight or obesity problems. Making it worrisome that they want to have more fuel efficient cars, will we be able to fit in them? Elevated cholesterol and blood fats. Diabetes. Arthritis, joint pains. Is anybody surprised I just mentioned that? Because normally we think, of, oh, well, I've got arthritis because, you know, I'm so heavy, so I'm putting extra stress on my joints. Nuh-uh. Nice rationale. Nice explanation. Wrong, but a nice explanation. That's related to the insulin resistance, not related to the fact that you're overstressing. Oh, does overstressing worsen arthritis problems? Absolutely. Can overweight create arthritis mechanical problems? Yes. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the underlying arthritis changes that are causing the joint discomforts. Related to allergies, who suddenly said, what? Allergies? Insulin resistance problem. How about sleep disordered breathing? You know, we might actually have an example of that. Two pilots in a heated discussion about airline policies might actually have been suffering with a sleep apnea type pattern yesterday when they overflew Minneapolis by about 150 miles. And you know they are increasingly concerned that people driving trains, trucks, and planes might actually have more problems falling asleep at the wheel or getting foggy thinking, slower reflexes, and so on. That sleep disordered breathing pattern is something I started researching in 1993 and, you know, surprisingly, none of the stuff that they taught me in medical school really was applicable. And the information that we've gained in our own clinical research has led to dramatic improvements in congestive heart failure patients, arrhythmia patients, others with a whole variety. Oh, did I mention a whole variety of conditions associated with insulin resistance? We'll get into that in a minute. How about chronic kidney disease? You know, we've got all these dialysis centers set up all over now. The good news is that someone else is paying for it. Because if you had to pay for it, you'd be much more interested in preserving kidney function than in just going for your dialysis treatments. But you see, your doctors don't have to worry about preserving kidney function because when you get a problem with it, we'll treat it. Again, reactive medicine rather than proactive medicine. Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. You know what's surprising? My goodness, these illnesses that we're talking about keep sounding like I'm giving Dr. Gutman's lecture from this morning. Strange. I wonder if there could be a link between inflammation, insulin resistance, glutathione. Well, I have to work on that. Stress. Well, you know, stress is actually due to your job, your wife, you know, because husbands won't ever cause stress, right? Your children, they certainly will. Your parents, they didn't mean to. The guy who cut you off when you were driving. 
the whatever, okay? We attribute stress to outside of ourselves, but the stress chemistry is actually churning away inside ourselves. And just as uh, Jimmy Gutman talked about the folks who are doing transcendental meditation actually have higher levels of glutathione and lower levels of biochemical stress on the inside, those are very real considerations that it's not just the churning away on the inside, but how our approach to living, our lifestyle, uh, leads us to do things that are proactive to help our well-being. How about high blood sugar during pregnancy, known as gestational diabetes? Oh, don't worry if you get it, we'll, we'll take care of it. Well, since we know a certain percentage of people get it, and since we can actually mark who is likely to, it's kind of like eclampsia and preeclampsia, you know, that's a magnesium deficiency. How do we know that? Because you go into the hospital with preeclampsia, we start shoving magnesium into you. Why not do that through your whole pregnancy? Wouldn't that prevent some of those people from being hospital? I guess that actually falls under, we have to wait for the Obamacare when we get higher quality, lower cost medical care. So we won't do that right now, we'll wait. But gestational diabetes certainly involved what about polycystic ovary syndrome? You know, one couple in six in the uh, United States, I don't know about Canada, but certainly in the United States, has fertility difficulties. And you stop and think, you go, gee, sex is pretty natural. Getting pregnant is pretty natural. Why would one couple in six have issues associated with pregnancy that wasn't happening 100 years ago? we've changed something biochemically and polycystic ovary syndrome is one of the more common ones diagnosed. So along with heart disease and high blood pressure and stroke, these seemingly different illnesses are all caused or worsened by insulin resistance. As insulin levels rise and gradually then blood sugars rise. Did, did you hear that? Gradually the blood sugars rise. You actually have the insulin problem while you still have the normal blood sugar. So it is diagnosable months, years ahead of time if your doctors know how to look. So as the blood sugars rise, you add more and more fat in your belly. You will notice the man has significant problems. He looks pregnant. About, what do you say, seven months? The woman, of course, is just putting on her jeans. Metabolic syndrome, syndrome X, central obesity, apple shape. Your belly is fatter, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, low HDL cholesterol and insulin resistance. Now you'll notice how, this is one of those commercial type things, I found that on the web. Insulin resistance is part of metabolic syndrome. No, 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 no. Metabolic syndrome is a cluster subset of insulin resistance. And you'll notice that they group these things, the high triglycerides, high blood pressure, rather than watching the trend occur on the way to developing these things, because it's clear you've already developed the problem if you have rising levels in each of these parameters that I labeled for you. Here's an example just of a way to think about it, whether you have obesity or insulin resistance. We've seen that they are clearly related on the patterns of the maps that I showed you in the beginning. You're getting a metabolic syndrome pattern most of the time developing cardiovascular disease or type 2 diabetes, and then of course the diabetes contributes to the cardiovascular disease. Think of it this way. Any part of the pie, you got the whole pie. Anytime you start showing the clusters, you have to pay attention because the underlying pathology inside your system is increasingly significant. It's not less significant, it's more significant. Let's talk about visceral fat that's around the belly organs. That's not the belly fat. We measure it by the belly fat, but it's the inside your belly fat. It's around the organs inside the abdominal muscles. And that is different from fat deposits elsewhere, including the ones on the outside of the abdominal muscles. Visceral fat produces inflammatory signals that affect organs and tissues all around the body. Inflammatory signals, first time that crept in. We'll have to check the slides, I don't know where that came from. Inside the belly fat producing inflammatory signals. 
Please don't ask your doctors about this. Way too confusing. It's led one of my colleagues to invent the term obesitis. You know, appendicitis, tonsillitis, all the itises are inflammation diseases. Well, obesitis, a pretty good terminology, actually, because it talks about the inflammation pattern that is the most concerning. Medical researchers are discovering even more health problems that may relate to insulin resistance. There are other organ disorders, infections, some cancers. Oh gosh, I'm back to having one of Dr. Gutman's slides creep into mine. Sorry about that. I think as we look at insulin resistance, you've got to understand, this is all research technology here that we're talking about. It starts first as observational when someone says, gosh, I keep seeing all these things as a cluster, I wonder, and then they start doing small studies, those get reported in the literature, more studies get funded, and it just takes time through that research pathway to get this reported in the journals. And remember from the maps in the beginning, we're dealing with the last 20 years, especially the last 10. That's way too short for the information to make it into the journals in large studies. But all of those 15 conditions that I outlined for you, plus other organ disorders, infections, cancers, and so on, are clearly related to the insulin resistance. Now, inflammation is the fire within, okay? And you'll notice these blue arrows at the very top relate to the five factors that we talked about specifically associated with metabolic syndrome. And then there's all these others clustered around the bottom. Well, Inflammation and is insulin resistance are the cause of all these conditions listed out here. But of course, that slide is way too difficult to see, so we'll take it in units. Here we have inflammation, the fire within, leading to obesity, which then, obesitis, visceral fat, leads to more inflammation, and we have a feedback mechanism going on here. Could that be one of the reasons why it's so difficult to lose weight? Well, of course, because the inflammation chemistry now turns against you instead of with you, and weight loss becomes a struggle because most of the ways to lose weight do not address the inflammation pattern underlying the insulin resistance. The moment you stop the dietary program, go back to anything resembling normal eating, the inflammation churns along. Oh, the inflammation creates more obesity, and this is that yo-yo that people talk about getting more and more and more. It doesn't matter how much they diet, they keep gaining more weight over time. Heart disease, diabetes, stroke, these are the major killers. This is the one that deprives you of your comfort, your life. Hypertension, high blood pressure has become the endemic pattern of our time. We are a nation of higher blood pressure. We've got down here stress, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, arthritis, Again, these are all of the common illnesses with which we are suffering. Again, from the inflammation causing high cholesterol and triglycerides, asthma and allergy problems, polycystic ovary syndrome. Over here, we're looking at chronic kidney disease, sleep disorders, gestational diabetes. Does anyone believe that we should focus on any other illness patterns besides these if we want to make a major impact in our public health patterns? It's not just here, folks. This slide comes from an oriental country. The Japanese Ministry of Health notes that they're concerned about metabolic syndrome. And they talk about staying active and eating right, and look at all these things starting to change as you start getting a little heavier, and then you start getting more problems with illnesses and such, and you finally fall off with metabolic syndrome and end up going to the hospital for those illnesses. This is a common concern around the world. Why? Well, they're not as fat as we are, guaranteed. They don't have the obesity, they don't have the diabetes epidemics the way we do. Those are much more unique to Western-based cultures. However, the mechanics of the biochemistry, the physiology in human beings is basically the same. We're talking about inflammation patterns associated with insulin resistance, doesn't matter the color of your skin, doesn't matter the country of your origin. All you have to do is tick the system the wrong way and it begins to work. Here's another one of those wonderful things. Here's 
longevity man, and then he starts to get metabolic imbalances. That's the insulin mismatch with the sugars. Metabolic syndrome arrives. We have diabetes, cancer, stroke, heart attack, and rest in peace. And then along the way, you get the chronic illnesses, inflammatory illnesses, asthma, arthritis, heart disease, diabetes. These are cute character, caricature cartoons, but the, the concept you need to have is that this is an unexposed public health problem. You don't hear about this on Oprah. You don't hear about this on PBS. You don't hear about this on CNN. You don't hear about this. And of course, if you don't get it from those three sources, it ain't gonna happen. So you better turn to Fox News. Isn't that right? Yeah, see? Okay, you don't hear about it there either. Here we are talking about how and why people get sick. Instead, what we're talking about on the news and such is how much money is going to be paid for your arthritis drugs, how much money for your cholesterol drugs, how much money is going to be paid for your heart surgery, how, how many people are going to be denied care that they need after their stroke. Uh, we got it backwards, guys. The problem isn't how much are we going to pay after you've got it, but my God, we're developing it at an increasing pace and an increasing percentage of the population. If you want to see why health care reform won't work, that's it, right there. You can't reform a system to where everybody requires a million dollars of care in the last 10 years of their life. Oh, pardon me. It could be that the last 10 years of their life start when they're 35, not when they're 65. Because when I started practice, I saw people with degenerative illnesses in their 70s and 80s, then their 60s and 70s, then their 50s and 60s, then their 40s and 50s, and now I'm seeing them routinely in their 30s and 40s. Dr. Gutman, you would agree that that pattern is very disturbing over our practice careers? Very, very serious concern. And this is just in the time frame in which we've been observing this last 30 some years, that was not what was happening in the old days. This is new. This is a created problem thanks to all of the changes that we've done in our world. So really what it comes down to is what can you do now? That's the most important part. Well, protecting and improving your health should be the primary goal. Honest to God, you really want to stay out of the system if you can. You really want to stay out of the system. The good news is that the dangerous effects of metabolic syndrome can be controlled even reversed. And here's some pointers. Learn which foods are good for you and which ones can aggravate insulin resistance. These are all personal things. These are not always, oh, well, I'll just avoid this or I'll avoid that. But actually, there are some good basic things that you can learn about, how to prepare healthy foods so that they build up your body's immunity and cell functions while reducing inflammation. We talked about a medical food this morning called ImmunoCal. We basically talked about glutathione enhancement. That's how you help reduce inflammation. Learn which medications and nutritional supplements you might need to control inflammation and reduce insulin resistance, and which ones might worsen your condition. You know, it's very disturbing, but chronic anti-inflammatories are not helpful. There's some real serious questions that daily Cialis might present some major problems because of interfering with the nitric oxide patterns. You maybe don't want to interfere with that on a chronic low-level basis. Maybe that's going to create more problems. Oh, but we don't have to study that because that's just a sexual drug. Well, maybe we're going to have more and more of those that are of concern. You know, the problems with statin drugs is that they're sold. Actually, the first problem is that they're made, okay? Because statin drugs very seriously challenge the physiology because they address none of the issues for which they were intended. All they're doing is taking down the higher levels rather than looking at why those levels got high to begin with. Now, it would be okay in my estimation if the people with high, high cholesterols had them lowered with a statin drug so long as they were taking active steps to treat the underlying cause. Oh, sorry, don't have enough time for that. See you next appointment. You know, the term doctor comes from Latin, the docere was the root word, and that comes from educare, which is to educate, or to take across from not understanding to understanding. 
Instead, what doctor means now is prescription writer, because we don't have time to educate our patients. We don't have the opportunity. And besides that, you know, the information is so confusing out there. You see it in newsletters, you see it in textbooks, you see it in journals. Who knows? I mean, I heard at the medical meeting that it's okay. Really? Really? Because if you go back and you look at the basic literature, the physiology hasn't changed much in the last 30 years, 40 years. What we're seeing simply is the physiology played out in the face of all of the societal changes we have made with regard to food patterns, with regard to medication, with regard to activities or lack thereof, and so on. So learn how to control inflammation and reduce insulin resistance and which things might worsen your condition. Learn what exercises and activities can help strengthen your body and reduce insulin resistance. Unfortunately, we choose a lot of things that we think are exercise, like golf. Golf is an activity, not actually an exercise. Easy to confuse, fun to do, not actually an exercise. Learn what you can do to make lifestyle changes that matter so that you can reduce stress, sleep better, and create joy in your life. How many people notice when you walk around the mall, the grocery store, anywhere else out in public, how many just overwhelmingly happy people are out there? All right, folks, we are in the richest countries on the face of the planet in the best time for human life in the history of man. We're not in Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, China. We're not where all of these health issues are daily challenges. We've got it good. Why are we so damn unhappy? What is it that we don't get about being alive and having the opportunities to make our lives wonderfully well work out? What is it that we can't sleep? I can't sleep, I just can't sleep. Really? Why can you not sleep? Oh, you know, I've just got worries. Worries, that's an interesting concept because it differs for everybody. My question is, if those worries are creating inflammation, is it worth it to you to fix the worries? Might be. Um, reducing stress, individual thing should be done by everybody. But then again, you know, I'm sorry, but my doctor doesn't have time to teach me and you know the Pilates class might help, yoga class might help, but then again you know if you don't know that that might help you don't make that lifestyle change. The National Institutes of Health declares that many major diseases can be more effectively controlled or even reversed by lifestyle changes rather than medications. The NIH says rather than medications. Wouldn't it be interesting if we actually abided by what the health institutes are saying for once. Since they're not talking about medications, they're talking about health. And all you need to know is what to do and exactly where an integrative physician comes in is at this point. How to do it for yourself. The Cash for Clunkers program <laughs> is called healthcare reform. Because it's okay if you smoke, we'll take care of it. It's okay if you drink, we'll take care of it. It's okay if you ride down the highway without a helmet, we'll take care of it. We're going to take care of everybody because we are very compassionate people. We are caring people. We are people who really want the best for everybody. So we're going to get cheaper cigarettes, cheaper alcohol, forget the helmet, just get a comb to everybody so that when they step off they can at least comb their hair. We've, we've adopted a lifestyle that looks like stink and then we're complaining because our doctors and our government won't fix our health. Sounds to me like we got it straight. Well, if you take a look at the number of U.S. deaths from behavioral causes, gee, well, there's some from sexual behavior and alcohol and motor vehicle and guns and drug-induced, but look at obesity and inactivity. Look at smoking. Those are striking. The largest potential for further improvement in population health. Population health. Does population health matter to you? Yes, because your taxes are going to be directly related to population health. Does population health matter to you? Yes, as my cabbie yesterday said that we have two speeds in the medical care system here in Canada. Slow and the other. Okay? You got to be able to pay for the other because slow is the usual speed. 
So population health matters to you because the more people who are healthy, the faster that slow speed looks. Or the more of your money you're going to have to devote to it because you really want the faster and it's increasingly expensive because they're laying taxes on you. But especially smoking and obesity, that's the way to do it. You know, <clears throat> Salonen in eastern Finland did a study about 20 years ago where they lined up about 2,000 men and they didn't have heart disease. I think they were aged 45 to 60. They measured a zillion things on them and then waited three years and I think about 70 of these folks ended up with heart attacks. And the question was, what was it about the 70 in their lab studies and other measurements that we could have picked them up in the beginning? That we could have picked them up to do preventive care, to do interventive care, rather than let the heart attack strike out of nowhere. You remember, 40% of the people with their first heart attack don't have obvious known risk factors, and 40% of those who get their first heart attack just wake up dead. Gives you few opportunities to redo parts of your life. Okay, so these are significant numbers. So of the 70 who had the heart attacks, they lined them up. Now you got your choices. You know the Heidi host. High cholesterol, high blood sugar, high triglycerides, high blood pressure, and so on. Which of the high DHOs do you think was number one on the risk factors for heart attack that would separate those 70 out from the others? Well, you guys are a real responsive group, so should I help you out? Because you know we're spending billions and billions and billions on cholesterol-lowering drugs, so it must be the cholesterol, right? Well, now wait a minute, I just showed you the epidemic of diabetes, so it's probably the high blood sugar. I mean, it's, you know, it's got to be one. Oh, could be high blood pressure because that blows things out, you know. Actually, it turns out it's none of those. It's the total number of cigarettes smoked in your lifetime. Line everybody up from the most cigarettes down to the least, and the ones who had the most over there are the ones that have the heart attacks. Factor number one. So, let's go to the second factor. Which of the Heidi Ho's? Remember, I've just coached you guys on cholesterol, sugar, blood pressure, and so on. A bunch of Aggies in the audience. Okay. Has nothing to do with the Heidi Ho's. Ferritin level. The higher the ferritin level, line them up, bring them down to the lowest. That's the group that has the heart attacks. Now, what the hell is ferritin? Well, it sounds kind of like iron, ferrous, ferritin, you know, stuff like that. Well, it turns out that when you're healthy, you transport your iron mostly on transferrin. Transferrin, transport iron. That sounds good. Okay. But you know how babies are alkalotic? You know, babies are soft and rubbery and smell good, and older folks are none of the same? <laughs> That's because older folks are becoming more acidotic over time. Well, acidosis is tough because it makes chemistry changes on the inside. Oh, we have a nickname for those chemistry changes. It's called inflammation. Well, you know what? As you become more inflamed on the inside, your acidotic pattern converts more of the iron transport onto ferritin instead of transferrin. Now, we haven't caught up to this. I realize it was 20 years ago. We haven't caught up to it quite yet because the lab reports will say up to 320 is a normal ferritin level. Oh, thank God. My ferritin is normal. But what Salonen found, remember this is an observational study. He had no bias in it. They measured a zillion things. What Salonen found was that if you have a ferritin of 100 or less, you have a normal heart attack risk. I don't know about you, but a normal heart attack risk sounds like I could still die from a heart attack. But 100 or less is the key. If you have 200, it's a more than double risk for heart attack. If you have 300, remember up to 320 is normal, but if you have 300, it's a more than triple risk for heart attack and so on. Did I mention the Heidi Ho's? Oh yeah, those are lower factors. So the number of cigarettes smoked and the inflammation patterns in your body, as indicated by high ferritin levels, are what we're talking about in terms of public health. Because you see, those are private factors. You can actually control the number of cigarettes you smoke and you can actually become aware and start to do something about the inflammation patterns inside you. Before we've ever talked about cholesterol, sugar, high blood pressure, and so on. So learn what you should be doing for yourself and your family based on the latest research findings. And trust me, these things keep coming out faster than you can shake sticks at.
there is a lot of research. Oh, the problem is it's in the basic science journals. Damn it. Who keeps up with those? I mean, it's hard enough to keep up with the clinical research journals. Oh, I don't read those. That's not my field. I read the ones in my field, not the other field. But, you know, if the 15 different diseases are associated with, you know, what we're talking about, this inflammation and all these other diseases from insulin resistance, maybe everything is your field. Or maybe inflammation is your only field. Now, you know, you might think because I'm talking to a bunch of dentists that it has nothing to do with you. No, it has everything to do with you. If they've got gingivitis, they've got inflammation. If they've got tooth decay, they've got acidosis. If they've got jaw problems, guess what? They're sick with inflammation patterns. And you're going to find insulin resistance in more and more of these folks. You get the first crack at them. You get the first opportunity to say, whoa, if we're going to have a problem with your implant, it might be because of other inflammation patterns. If we're going to have problems where you keep rotting out your metal fillings, maybe it's because there's some other health issues going on. So the research findings involve all of us, not just some of us. These and many other life-saving strategies will provide the tools for a brighter, healthier tomorrow. And what you need now is a personalized and unique treatment program. I would caution you against the Texas Ranger theory of medicine. Everybody knows what that is, right? Oh, a bunch, bunch of Aggies here. Good gosh. Okay. So the deal is that the town was having a riot. So they cabled to Austin. We have a riot. Send the Rangers. So the cable came back and said, meet tomorrow afternoon's train. So the good townsfolk gather at the station on the platform and Train pulls up, and Ranger steps off, and adjusts his gun belt, dusts off his hat, puts it on. And the mayor runs up and says, we're so glad to see you. Where are the others? Ranger says, what others? He says, we've <laughs> we got a riot. We asked for the Rangers. And the reply is, one riot, one Ranger. That's in Texas lore, guys. I mean, this is real. We're not big for nothing. So, so the deal that you've got to get is that if you've got a disease, you know there's a drug for it. One disease, one drug. One problem, one drug. One something, one drug. And that's exactly why your doctor immediately reaches for his prescription pad, because he can fix that. You see, the problem is we go in expecting that, wanting that. I get patients very upset when I don't give them a prescription on the way out. Just advice. Remember what I said about teaching as opposed to writing prescriptions, and that indeed might be the most important part about the lifestyle change. Here's the most important part of diagnosis, listening to your patients. Boy, that's a drag too, because you ask a question and they talk, and they talk, and they talk, and you've got to sort out and get to the right kinds of questions to ask. But that's where diagnosis happens, it's not in the laboratory. Here's what's the problem with what we're looking at. You can see what we're looking at, right? because sometimes it's kind of hard to see the pattern. But that indeed is the job of the doctor to find that pattern. And that comes from putting the whole picture together. This is holistic medicine in terms of the whole body, the whole lifestyle, the whole thing together. The gut is absolutely essential to fix. We've got to fix the acid in the stomach, the base that comes from the pancreas and the gallbladder, and we've got to fix the paving stones or the leaky gut that comes from interrupting the cells in the gut lining, and we've got to have the right kind of probiotic pattern growing inside us. If you don't fix this, forget fixing inflammation, it won't happen. Every car has five wheels. You do know that, right? Five. Which do you fix first? Who cares? Got to have all five, okay? You got to fix all five at the same time, and again, that's the trick with integrative medicine, because then you have a usable vehicle. Just exactly how do you get sick? You gotta remember things like toxic blockers that are happening because our entire world has become sick. You have gotta remember trace factors. You know, it's hard to brush your teeth without toothpaste. If you take the hinge pins out of the door, it's a very small part of the house. But you know what? You take them all out, your house is no longer secure and it certainly isn't safe. Don't keep trying to open and close that door. It will get you. You've got to turn on all the switches on the inside. If you want to make a smoothie, you can pour everything into the blender, put the top on, and watch it all day long. 
You got to punch the button, turn on the switch. That's what makes things happen. Now, it's easy to say avoid toxic things because, you know, who wants to deal with, well, I guess, no, that's not so true because, well, you dentists deal with all the mercury, so it must be safe, right? No, but you're aware that it's not safe. There are a whole bunch of things that we're totally unaware of as not safe. And yet we go blindly through ourselves, just kind of condoning this in a society. You know, the, the oils become carcinogenic as you heat them up. The average number of heatings for uh, oils at a, it's called a quick serve restaurant. That's the politically correct term. The average number of cycles is 17 before they change the oil. So you go, okay, so 18 hours in a day, they change it every day. No, that might take two weeks before they change the oil in which they make those delicious fries. And this is the real thing, I must tell you. We drink all of these sugar drinks every year. We drink more than before. And you wonder why people are having issues. You know, there's 35,000 McDonald's worldwide. They are a major economic force. They're just like Walmart. You know, you want to do something different? Don't. You won't be allowed. But remember that what we think is food, cockroaches won't eat. How do I know? I asked him. And he said, no, it's got preservatives, it's got processing, it's got all that nasty stuff. How about if when you started to eat, it looked like this? Do you think that all those pesticides and herbicides aren't there just because you washed it? Guess what? And you remember, we've plowed down apple trees because it's cheaper to import apples from China. We now have a lot of our food source coming from elsewhere where they don't care about DDT. Hmm, DDT in me? No, couldn't happen. Watch out for your salads. How about Maalox? You know what the A-L stands for, right? Aluminum. Aluminum, very serious stuff. Not something you want to be playing with. And yet we reach for that all the time. Why? Because remember, our guts have been destroyed. So we no longer can control the discomfort in our guts and we get inflammatory gut diseases, which we'll talk about later. You like the intense colors? Aren't they gorgeous? They're all toxic metals. That's the intensity. You know, we don't think of it, but in our lives we encounter all of these things that are subtly poisonous. This we know is acute lead poisoning. There's no question about it. <laughs> but we don't recognize the more subtle things that happen that we come into contact with. Who took a shower today? Did you use soap? Do you remember how they cleaned the bathroom before you arrived at that hotel room? We're exposed to all these chemicals constantly. It's not obvious, so we're not aware of the poisoning. Oh, this is an actually safe silver filling. You've heard of ones with mercury, but this one doesn't have mercury, it's just silver. And that's kind of the way that people think of it, because it's not so obvious that that's toxic. It's not so obvious that this is toxic. And yet, we indeed have problems with tobacco exposing us to mean and nasty things. Don't forget alcohol, because that's an increasingly major problem with the stress that we have to endure in this country. Oh, incidentally, did you know that alcohol is a recession-proof industry? I visited a distillery in Lexington, Kentucky. They can't make it fast enough now. And, and, and the deal is, is that when people get depressed, what do they do? They drink. When they drink, they're getting the empty calories. Oh, we were talking about that obesity and diabetes thing. Does not happen with alcohol, you'll be glad to know. So you can drink to that tonight. And you believe that, right? But don't worry, because if it upsets your stomach, you can take that little purple pill. Now, the problem with taking that little purple pill is it disrupts everything in the physiology. What do you think? God made a mistake? Gave you too much stomach acid? Mm. And too much cholesterol. And he gave you too high a blood pressure. I'll tell you, I'd pick a different God, because there's all these mistakes he seemed to make. Happily, we've got doctors to correct it. You just... <laughs> You just have to give them enough information and they'll know which of those pills that you need. You have to remember in this society there is no clean air. There is no clean water. There is no clean food. Now, we can look at this and we go, oh, well, that's obvious. I mean, you wouldn't eat that. You'd throw that away. Yeah, but what about the ones that don't look like that but are also tainted with the pesticides and the processing and so on? It's hard to look at the foods and say, well, that doesn't look wholesome and healthy. It's hard to know that because they are subtle poisonings on the inside. The yeast syndrome, an increasing problem in our world, creates and lives and thrives off acidosis. 
It's something that is affecting all of us biochemically as an infection. One of the things Dr. Gutman was talking about is infections as well. Thyroid disease, an increasingly greater problem with setting our own thermostats on the inside. One of the most sensitive glands that gets affected by toxicity, acidosis, and so on. You know, you become acidotic, and it's very difficult for you to absorb your iodine. Whoa. Well, we're short of iodine anyway, because you remember they put iodine in the foods 100 years ago in the salt so that we'd stop the goiter, and then 50 years later told everybody stay away from salt because it'll make high blood pressure. So do you think we stay away from salt? You bet. I don't add salt to anything. I eat pretzels, pickles, popcorn, peanuts. Do you think they add iodine to that salt? Of course not. So you still get the salt, but not the iodine. That's a disaster. Oxygen, I told you in 1993, I started doing special studies. You know, everybody knows that at altitude, you get oxygen deficiency problems. What about at sea level? Because an increasing number of people simply are short of oxygen. And you know, with Medicare, you have to be half dead in order to get a prescription for oxygen. That's going to expand, of course, under Obamacare. But the point that we need to know is if you have congestive heart failure, if you have heart disease, if you have a whole variety of other issues, oxygen becomes absolutely essential to get you back to alkalosis rather than acidosis. And you really got to get this diagnosed right. Because if you use the standard diagnosis, you end up with a standard look-see at things. And you know what? For the most part, the standard look-see looks to me like we're mostly victims in the healthcare system. We are not mostly victors. I think we should reverse the issue. <laughs> and that makes sense to me. That's, as Dr. Goodman said, I'm a little crazy, okay? But it makes sense to me that we need to turn the tables on this because so far, you know, how's it working for you, what we're currently doing? It looks to me like on a population health strategy, we are really messing up. And if how it's looking for you isn't right, the only person who can make it different for you is you. Other than that, the rest of the folks are on that Titanic on their own. Oh, I'm on the same damn Titanic. You know, Paul Ehrlich, who wrote The Population Bomb in 1964, was one of my professors at, at Stanford. And he said, it's very simple. If you think that you can make a difference for the future of the world, it makes sense to recycle and go green and all this other stuff. If you think, on the other hand, that you have booked passage on the Titanic, there is no sense in going steerage go first class. So the deal is, is that you can go first class with your own health care, you can go first class with your own lifestyle, you will absolutely turn the tables on the current system. You know, what you really need is the right physician and the right dentist to serve as your partners for a healthier tomorrow because they can really instrumentally help in reversing inflammation and insulin resistance. They can make a world that really is much sweeter where you do have time and joy to smell the roses. I guess, you know, no matter how, id how idyllic life feels or appears, and no matter how long we think our good health will last, we actually have to make strategy changes. We have to do this ourselves, each one of us, every day. And so then my real question comes, are we losing the battle of insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome? Well, I guess my question comes down to how many doctors do you know who are treating these conditions from an integrative perspective, which is the only one that will ever work. And when you answer that honestly, the battle doesn't look like it's going in our direction. So individually, we have to make the difference ourselves. Your body is your personal spacesuit in the same way that astronauts get around safely in the dangerous environment of outer space. You can improve your personal spacesuit to get around better in the hostile environment of planet Earth. Thank you very much. There are no questions. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah question. Yeah. Um, but you didn't give any specifics. I mean, no. It's, it's not easy to go out there and, and think even if you think you're buying whole from food. Exactly. You still Absolutely. Um, so you really need to be specific on what to do to eliminate inflammation. I know you're not recommending NSAIDs every day. Correct. Uh, so if, if we're not recommending NSAIDs and such, what do we really talk about in terms of specific strategies that you can use. I'm actually working on a book in that regard, okay? 
And again, you can give some general outlines, but everybody becomes different, especially with regard to food allergies and with regard to digestive issues. Those are the major concerns that really you have to pay attention to. The, the, the one word diet is one thing that I've come up with, okay? If you want to find something that you want to eat, look at the label. If the first word is the food that you want to eat, like banana, okay, and that's what it is, is banana, then you win. If there's any other words, you lose. So the problem is, is that all of the packaged foods have more words. And all those words generally are a loss. So the more you eat fresh, whole, and raw, the more better you're going to do in terms of controlling inflammation. The less you eat of sugars and starches, the more you eat of meats, eggs, vegetables, yogurt, the more better you're going to do. Um, we'll talk about that program in, in the next lecture, but the, the concept that you need to have is that primitive diets worked. The more primitive, the more they worked. What we have now are very, very advanced diets. We have all this food that's been prepared. We have all these things that have been processed because, you know what, we are so busy with living life, we don't have time to preserve and protect it. What we do is rush through our meals because that's, see, a, a, a really an optional part in life. Because if you can, just, you can grab something on the run between the dance lessons and the baseball game and the this and the that that we busy our lives with. And we mostly have it wrong. We, we have the most precious opportunity to, to safeguard our health and we blow it because we don't take the time for ourselves. So the food, um, you know, should we, should we barbecue steak? Oh yeah, I think so. Don't char it, okay? And know that you are taking a bit of a health risk in terms of that kind of cooking style because it's much better to bake it. Is it better to get organic foods? Absolutely. Hard to do, okay? And you've got to be aware that the terms natural and organic are vastly misused because they are good marketing ploys. You know, charcoal is natural, okay? You probably don't want to suck on charcoal unless you need to detoxify some things, but that's a natural thing. Uh, and when they talk about naturally prepared and such, you've got to be careful. Organic, uh, the government wrestles with the definition a whole lot. You know where fertilizer came from? World War II. You know why? Because at the end of the war, we had piles of all these nitrates around that we were using to make nitroglycerin and other explosives. What do you do with it? Well, I mean, you know, you spent the money to make it, you might as well get some value out of it. Hey, we could put some potassium with it and, and, and some magnesium and some other, you know, whatever you want to put. Phosphorus works great, makes big plants. Why don't we just make some basic fertilizers and try this on the fields? That's where non-organic farming came from, was 60 years ago. Before then, guess what we did? We actually let land lay fallow, we actually plowed it up correctly and plowed in organic nutrients, you know, manure and things like that. We actually had real food. I, I tell people if you eat plastic food, you get plastic people. And that's mostly what we do. And you know, is, is this bisphenol A? Of course it is. Is that like a trade-off? Of course. Because I'm not hauling around a, a thermos bottle with glass on the inside and so on. So we're making trade-offs constantly in our lives. The question is whether we're going to be happy with the degenerative diseases that result. I know that I'm going to get degenerative diseases. I want them later, lesser, and not bugging me until I actually die. Who remembers the story of the marvelous one horse Shea? Remember that from school? Okay, the Shea was built in 100 years to the day. It functioned perfectly fine until it completely fell apart that day. That's what I want, okay? I want to function fine until I completely fall apart all of a sudden. And I actually want to be shot by a jealous husband at about age, <laughs> at about age 124, <laughs> running away, but his aim is better than mine.